Association for hosting this very important conversation and for curating such a fantastic panel of speakers who really bring a breadth of experience from across politics, from diplomacy, academia and research, and all of whom are actively contributing to our national conversation on racism, identity and inequality, and how our economic and our foreign policy, particularly our relationship with China, plays into these social realities. So a quick intros, joining me tonight, we have Jenny Leong, state member uh, for the electorate of Newtown in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, elected in 2015. Her portfolio responsibilities include housing, homelessness, women's rights and human rights. She's also a UCID alum and while here held leadership roles as a fellow on the University of Sydney Senate and as the president of the Sydney University Postgraduate Association. Welcome, Jenny. Uh, next to her is Peter Chen. He's a senior lecturer here at University of Sydney and teaches on media politics, public policy and Australian politics. His research interests focus on, the new, on new media's impacts on electoral politics, media regulation, social movements, and the politics of animal protection. And next to him, Dr. David Brophy is a senior lecturer in modern Chinese history, also here at UCID. And his main research areas include the history of Qing and Republic, Republican China, as well as early modern Eurasia. I do note he has a new book out, China Panic, which we will touch on earlier, uh, later in this, this evening. Um, and finally, Natasha Kassam, Director of the Lowy Institute's Public Opinion and Foreign Policy Program, researching Australia's Indo-Pacific strategy, China's domestic politics, Taiwan, and Australia-China relations. Natasha is a former Australian diplomat and a fellow at the ANU's National Security College's Futures Council which is also an integral part of the drafting of the Australian government's 2017 foreign policy white paper. So welcome to that esteemed group. Uh, and before we kick off, I just have a couple of uh, housekeeping points. So we've got a pretty ambitious agenda to cover. I'm going to throw some questions at our panelists uh, and then I'm really gonna open it up to the floor. Uh, if you're social media inclined, please keep the hashtag Stop Asian Hate in any of your posts this evening. Uh, I will note Jenny does have to depart at 6.30, so if you mm -hmm. see her slip off, uh, that's because she's got another engagement uh, and we wish her well with that. So look, to set the scene, I think, uh, you know, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, reports of anti-Asian racism and incidents of hate have seen a massive increase across Australia and in many parts of the world. We've seen horrific examples of this in the United States and also here in Australia with over 520 COVID related racist incidents reported in just the last year. Of course, adding fuel to the fire really is our worsening diplomatic relationship with China and the media and political rhetoric that surrounds that which at times seems quite unable to separate the actions of the Chinese Communist Party with that of the very diverse and vibrant Chinese Australian diaspora. And of course, as xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiment rises, our borders remain closed to skilled migration, to new international students, to tourists who contribute both to our rich social fabric, but also to our economy. Our borders even remain closed to some of our own citizens, most glaringly recently those from India. And beyond the pandemic and the diplomatic relations, across all of our institutions, we see a lack of cultural diversity represented in our media, in our politics, and at the top of business and academic leadership. These issues and instances all really call into question this seeming national identity that claims to embrace cultural diversity, to celebrate its multi-ethnic roots, and an identity that's really built on generations of, of migration. 
So tonight we will try to unpack some of these issues uh, to create space to listen and to hear the stories of our panelists, but also of you, our audience. So please get your questions ready. Uh, I will be asking them interspersed with questions to the panel. If you're joining us online, you can submit them at any point and I will do my best to get to them as we go through this evening. So without further ado, Jenny, I really want to start with you. I mean, we've seen very troubling instances of racism towards the Asian diaspora, especially those of Chinese heritage since the outbreak of COVID. We know that there has been an immediate increase, but how has this pandemic, I guess, heightened the awareness of a problem that runs a lot deeper, that's more systemic? Yeah, thank you so much. And I'd like to join you by acknowledging that we are here on Sydney Uni's campus, which is on Gadigal land and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. I think um, it's important whenever we're talking particularly about issues of racism, um, that we recognise that the kind of um, racism that has been inflicted um, over time on Asian communities on, and anti-Chinese sentiment is actually nothing compared to the horrific racism and genocide and invasion that occurred to First Nations people in this country. And we need to give that that space as you identified, Jet. So thank you for that. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to be here. And I really wish that we didn't have to talk about this. I really wish that I could focus more on issues of housing and homelessness. I could focus on issues of women's rights, which are certainly um, not lacking uh, for the need for change at the moment. But the reality is that we are faced with a problem that is not new. And for anyone in this room that has Asian or Chinese heritage would know that this is not a new problem. The issues of, of anti-Asian sentiment, of whipping up racism and fear, of fear of invasion, of yellow peril, of all of these things are not new to this country. But sadly, what appears to be the case and what is new is the level at which it is impacting and affecting people because it is increasing significantly. For me, my politics and my, my story goes back to a time I was studying at this university doing nothing to do with politics at all um, or international relations or human rights world. I was, I was happily doing a degree in performance studies about the need to develop a theatre archive for Australia but the level of racism that I saw around the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees and John Howard, the then Prime Minister's words to say that we decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come resonated really strongly with me because for me, there was only a small gap of my dad deciding to come as an international student from Malaysia and me finding myself being born in Adelaide to have been finding myself in a very different situation. And so for me, as someone that has been born in this country, but feels like quite often it feels dangerous to feel proud of this country, but also feels dangerous to not say that I'm proud of this country, um, is becoming more and more complex. As you point out, the level of warmongering, the level of anti-Asian hate are both causing complexities around that. What does that look like? It looks like to me the idea that One Nation and Pauline Hanson and their views about Asian Australians and about Asians was something that was seen as very sidelined and very extreme. And you look decades on over the course of my political involvement and engagement, and that has now become completely mainstream. So we see it on the front page of the paper. We see it spouted by mainstream political parties. And I think that is a challenge. To me, the biggest example of the risk is it feels like a radical and scary thing to say that I'm proud of my Chinese heritage. It feels like a radical thing for people to be proud of coming from China and to identify that they are Chinese. And that demonstrates the level of toxic racism and the danger that exists for the kind of society we have created. I think we don't get anywhere until that doesn't feel nervous. I want, I'm trying to learn Mandarin. I'm doing a very bad job, so I'm not gonna do it tonight. But um, <laughs> I'm trying to learn Mandarin. And I spoke at an event earlier this year where I gave an introduction in Mandarin. It was literally three sentences, but it's the best I can do, right? And, um, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, that's a very brave thing for an Australian politician to do. And it shouldn't be brave to do that. And that, I think, sums up for me the challenges we face around it. 
and, and around the idea of where we currently sit in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Gone are the days of Kevin Rudd. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and okay. my interest. Mandarin is, is really <laughs> nothing compared to Kevin Rudd's, I tell you. <laughs> now, I want to talk a bit about our relationship uh, with China and how this plays into a rise in xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiment. Um, and given, I guess, the expertise on this panel and our host this evening being the China Development Society, I think we will stick a little bit to the China topic. So um, please uh, bear with us with that. I know the whole topic is much broader than that, but just given who we have here tonight, I think we'll drill a little bit into it. So I want to throw um, to David, uh, you have a book just out, China Panic, uh, and in this you say uh, a, a, a bit about Xi Jinping and the, and the changing of our relationship. You say when he visited Australia in 2014, Chinese President Xi Jinping said there was an ocean of goodwill between Australia and China. Since then, that ocean has shown dramatic signs of freezing over and Australia is in the grip of the China panic. So how did Australia get here? And, you know, were we on track to this well before the pandemic broke out? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation. And um, <coughs> I think that this... This question is, um, I think we want to allow for a certain distance between these two discussions. I mean, there are lots of people out there tackling the question of anti-Asian racism. We're not yet thinking about the geopolitical dimensions of this. There's also a whole geopolitical debate taking place that, that is, you know, quite separate from this discussion of you know, domestic racism in Australia. So, but while acknowledging that these are two separate debates, very much these are things we need to understand as, as intertwined, um, probably in a couple of different dimensions. I mean, I often speculate about the question of whether or not, you know, a latent anti-Asian racism has made it easier for politicians to shift the discourse towards a confrontational uh, approach towards China. Um, and then in terms of the consequences of that approach, it's very clear to me um, that this, this turn that we've seen in the last three to four years has had a significant contribution to the, um, the rise in anti-Asian racism that we, that we see. And that is, that is to me, not that, not that surprising when you think about the way geopolitics works, um, when you have a policy that is being driven by security concerns that, that people derive from shifts in geopolitical tectonics that are taking place far away in Asia. If you want to bring that home to people, there's always a temptation to try to sort of bring the enemy closer to home by, by telling people that, you know, the, the threat is already here, that there is this subversive activity taking place um, that is, um, you know, must be combated. And that, that has, um, the, the exaggeration and um, innuendo that that, that has um, fostered is clearly part of this new form of racism towards um, Chinese in Australia that really centers on the idea of the Chinese as a, as a suspect community, um, a community who, who might be white anti Australian quality in some way. And, and I mean, I, I think that this is you know, built in many ways on the, the type of attitudes that have been cultivated towards Muslim Australians in the last 20 years um, as a sort of a potential domestic enemy in the context of the, the war on terror. Now, Okay, so setting that aside, then the question of how did we actually um, get here? And I, you know, I, I, I don't think that racism is really a motivating factor uh, in the direction of Australian policy. I think that it is being driven by geopolitics. I think that, you know, if we compare, say, from 2014, that quote from Xi Jinping, um, his visit to Australia, um, to now, what's, what's been the significant shift? Well, clearly there's less confidence in Australia that the status quo in East Asia will, uh, will maintain, um, that China's rise is leading to a, a relative decline in, um, uh, in the, the role of the United States uh, in that region. And that is, that is troubling to a whole section of the Australian foreign policy establishment. We have to remember that Australia, since its settlement, since colonization, uh, has always um, pursued its regional interests with the, uh, with the comforting presence of a large, powerful uh, patron, uh, first Great Britain for a long time and then the United States. So for, for people in Canberra to imagine the possibility of Australia 
um, acting alone without the United States is a you know it's a very traumatic um, thing, and and I think that this is very you know obvious when you read the analysis that's coming out of the um, the security um, sector at the uh, at the moment. Um, now the question is that well, how does Australia behave in that situation? You often find people you know talking about how America is just sort of prodding encouraging Australia to be more aggressive towards China. I don't actually think that that's, that's what's going on. I think it's this Australian anxiety that America may be backing away, may be less invested in this region that prompts Australia to step up and be more loud, more um, uh, attention grabbing in its, um, in its rhetoric towards China, partly as a way of signaling to the United States that we are prepared to um, do more to carry the burden to to retain your presence uh, in this region. So this is this is all about geopolitics. Um, there's um, this is really about a an effort to um, sustain a, a political status quo in the region that Australian elites believe has has benefited Australia up until uh, up until this point. Now whether or not it has, um, that's another question, of course. But um, I think I'll I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Right. Well, Peter, I guess, you know, talking about uh, having that geopolitical conversation at home uh, and I guess looking at the media and how it covers our worsening relationship with China, do you see a link there to that worsening relationship and a rise in kind of rhetoric that is anti-Asian, anti-Chinese in the domestic press? Yeah. Question. I mean, I think I think just following on from what David said, I, I think there are a number of factors that have changed the, um, the Australia-China relationship. Uh, everything I think that says is true. So when we add that, the Australia used to do a very deep sleight of hand with regards to managing the China relationship, and that is that it would cooperate with the United States in a sphere of influence that was outside of the Australian region. And in exchange, secure you know, American support in the region with regards to containing the China economic strategy. And with the drawdown, obviously, the interest of, China, uh, of the United States directly in terms of the Middle East, uh, it is interesting that Australia actually has now started to talk directly about its region. And I think part of that is also explained by the fact that China and Australia now do directly compete here strategically in regards to relations with the South Pacific. And one of the things I think is very interesting about Australian public discourse around its foreign affairs is it's actually relatively poorly formed in that there's obviously a lot of discussion about Australia's relationship with China, Australia's relationship with the United States, for example. They are clearly really important um, uh, um, relationships that we have. But we also have to understand that Australia does see itself as a mini hegemon in the South Pacific. And China is now, in a sense, starting to form relationships with South Pacific countries that Australia actually thought it had with the United States. So things have changed, and that, and that does change the quote-unquote freedom of action that Australia engages in, given that there is this really rock-solid view that Australia is fundamentally dependent on the United States. So when we come to the, the media, I'd probably just say, um, just uh, on that matter, I mean, I don't know, I grew up in Queensland in the 1970s. Uh, I grew up in Brisbane. Uh, when I was growing up in Brisbane, there were only five chairs in Oakbrook, and they were my father, his father, and his brothers. That was it. And so I grew up in a very racist society, actually. And so I think racism is at the heart of it, and it creates those tropes that are easily reinterpreted. So this trope about the, the Chinese are sneaky people, untrustworthy, they don't have a true alliance to Australia. I think that has been uh, something that's existed, you know, for hundreds of years in the Australian uh, community, and it's easy then for media to reutilise, repackage. You know, you turn, you know, inscrutable Chinese into, you know, agents of the Communist Party, which is what you know, the Chinese um, But certainly, the Chinese community has experienced waves of intense hatred at times, and that has declined, and that does make the Australian Chinese community quite different to the Indigenous community in Australia, which receives persistent and continuous hatred at all times. And so um, what I think that means is that while, oddly enough, the 
in Indigenous communities, there's often actually greater resilience to this enduring hatred. Um, it can actually come to quite, as quite a shock, particularly because of waves of migration. Often people who are in Australia today experience that racism for the first time, whereas a community that's been in, you know, in for a longer time will know that these things come and they go, more chance period. We can think about the 1980s, for example, and stuff like that. Um, these things come and go, but they're certainly a trope that the media does like to look for a time to secure a pond. Clearly, the rise of Bob China has made that a much more attractive discussion topic because it just dominates the amount of time that the Australian media is coming to China. And given the comparatively weak cultural competency of the media, the capacity to talk about China, uh, um, we, we stay too still. There's also a button over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, the silver panel um, uh, allows <laughs> allows that to occur. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, but I mean, but I think uh, I think often some of these things, like COVID, for example, really just seem like opportune excuses mm. for you know relatively recycled ways of kind of reporting in some regards. And um, you know, we can think of during the height of the, the housing um, housing okay. issues uh, previously. You'd see news articles on quality news television channels like the ABC, mm -hmm. where they'd be talking about how Australians can't buy houses, and then they'd have a sweeping shot of like Asian people, like that they weren't Australians, and like maybe they're not, but like I'm sure they, they hadn't established that. Yeah. So that uh, also talks to a kind of sloppiness. Well, we had election. two alternative premiers also making that point in the lead up to the last two state elections. You know, it's not just it's not just the right wing media; it's also you know, this is the, the views that are being spouted to be able to maintain power. Yeah, that's right. Now, I want to turn to Natasha because I know the Lowy Institute has been tracking a lot of this and looking at um, how these issues have actually impacted the lives of Australian Chinese communities in a recent project, Being Chinese in Australia. Can you tell us a little bit about that project and its findings and how it kind of plays into the narrative? <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you. And thanks to the China Development Society for having me here today. I think it's um, a really wonderful initiative and great to have a diversity of views up here on the panel. Um, if we get time, I might weigh in on some of the geopolitical comments later, but I will first tell you about this project that um, we've been running at the Institute for about eight months now. It's a three year project that is um, looking at questions of multiculturalism, identity and influence. And the first part of that that we released a couple of months ago was a survey of a thousand um, Australians of Chinese background. It included permanent residents and long-term visa holders. And we asked them a range of questions that we've been asking Australia, other, like the broad Australian population um, for the last 16 years in the annual Lowy Institute poll, as well as things that are asked in other um, public opinion surveys around the country, um, like the Scanlon Foundation, who do a lot of issue, questions about social cohesion and immigration. Look, we, we, what we essentially discovered, I don't think will be news to anyone in this room, but there was just an incredible diversity in the community in terms of their upbringing, their views on Australia, their views on China, views on immigration, uh, views on all the questions of the day. Um, and what it led us to think about as the next parts of the project is just how complex it is to design policy around this, um, you know, stop Asian hate and addressing some of these issues. You know, to, I think to anybody in this room, it feels like it should be easy, right? Just don't be racist and, you know, let's um, actually be the multicultural country that we plan to be or claim to be. But, you know, just as one example that I just thought of as a finding from that, um, from that report after what was just said was that, you know, there's no doubt the media to some extent plays a role in this. But in the people that we surveyed, half the population that we surveyed said that Australian media reporting about China is too negative, but 20% said it was too positive, right? And on every view, every question, we had this broad polarity. So as much as there is a really significant part of the community that when we go out and survey and we're doing focus groups at the moment, 
um, we hear from a really significant proportion that says the demonizing of China in the media is really affecting our lives negatively. The idea of the Chinese community as you know, spies or being dodgy in some ways really affecting our community. The flip side is we also meet people in these focus groups and in these surveys who say actually like I'm being threatened or I'm being intimidated or something, you know, I'm worried that I can't speak out about something or attend a protest about something because of my family in China. So um, I'm not trying to justify any policies. I would say even the people that we survey who say that they are very worried about foreign interference in Australia, they still think that these policies have been damaging to the communities. Um, so I'm not trying to justify that, but I am just saying that there is a really broad range of views about what's supposed to be done. And so I don't envy the people responsible for having to come up with policies um, to respond to these things. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, these tropes and this racism that I think does kind of lie at the heart of a lot of these issues. Um, it really, to me, there's just this really big question where our politicians and leaders, uh, they really love to say that Australia is the most successful multicultural country um, in the world. And, but we see time and time again, different treatment for Australians of Chinese background, Australians of Indian background, Muslim Australians, which you know, I am one of. Um, and I really think that it's so hard for those two things to be reconciled, but actually they don't get called out on it for the reasons that have been identified, which is that, you know, the media and our parliament is not very representative of our country. And now we see that the way the China debate is playing out, that there are further, um, further obstacles in place for people who do actually want to stand up and speak out and represent their communities and stand for office or whatever it might be. So, you know, the way this debate is going, I'm feeling quite pessimistic actually about our abilities to um, see more diversity in those levels of leadership in the country. And I think, you know, I said at the beginning, I feel like policy making is really hard in this place, but trying to remove those obstacles for me is where a lot of this should start. Thanks. Well, Jenny, I mean, you are one of those people standing up uh, as a beacon representing diverse Australians and uh, you are involved in policy making. I know you were recently um, at the anti-Asian hate vig vigil in Sydney, which was calling for the government to do more to address racism in this country. I mean, what, what is the solution? What are some practical things that can really happen to shift the dial? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, it's, I think it's really interesting as to as to how we solve some of these challenges because I think we need to recognise that a lot of the racism that we're talking about here is actually fueled by the polarity that Natasha was just talking about, and the fact that these structural barriers exist not in a natural setting; they exist because of failures to introduce certain policies or or domestic politics interests and, and powerful political interests that benefit from a tough on border stance and a, um, a hardline stance on, on China international relations. So I take David's point around the geopolitical reality of that, but we also need to recognise there is a, a domestic political reality that benefits um, particularly conservative governments heading into elections, I referred to John Howard and the use of the, you know, we decide who comes to this country. I mean, basically Morrison and Dutton are now playing out that slogan in a way that John Howard would be incredibly proud. They are literally closing our borders to, to our own citizens. They are locking up, you know, people and putting people under the guise of the pandemic on Christmas Island if they're from China, but taking them into five-star accommodation in the Sydney CBD if they're from the US or the UK. I think we need to recognise that there is a domestic political aspect to this that fuels the idea of being able to look like the person who is leading this country is in charge of what is happening and has a power play, which I think needs to be looked at. But I think in terms of what other things can be done structurally, I think we need to look at where are the barriers and all of the research, whether it's the research that Natasha has just talked about, the research in terms of um, the Asian Australian Alliance or research that's been done out of the Human Rights Commission in terms of career progression and discrimination around recruitment and those kind of things, they all have a huge impact on how we're identifying leaders 
to be able to step up and ensure diversity in the in the rooms where decisions are being made. I the other day met with some journalism students, both of who were um, were from a Chinese background, and said we're the only two media students in our class, and all of our teachers are also white, and we're just like not connected with anybody that understands the challenges of like existing in our space and trying to get a job in the media. And so I think when we look at these, where do these kind of positions exist? What does it look like when all of the people that are students here go into a classroom? Who are the lecturers? Who are the experts that are put on television to talk about what's happening in terms of these geopolitical realities? Who are the people that are getting promoted in DFAT and other parts of our decision? These are all challenging factors. They are structural problems that are easily structurally fixed by setting quotas, by setting targets, by setting goals, by requiring these things to happen. Then there's sort of the, the issue around racism that is underreported, that is not taken seriously and not dealt with. I don't know about anyone in this room, but I would not feel comfortable going to the New South Wales police if someone hurled racist abuse on me on the bus tomorrow. I don't think I would feel comfortable going to the New South Wales police and saying, hi, I'm at the Newtown Cop Station and I'd like to report a racist incident. Now, that's what people should do, absolutely. But is that police station ready and equipped to take that complaint? Very unlikely. And so what we have is we also accept that we acknowledge racism is bad, but we refuse to put the necessary resourcing and structures in place to actually deal with that adequately. Those, to me, are two very easy places where we can start engaging in that space because the more diversity you have around the table, the more perspectives you have on that, the easier it is to solve those policy outcomes because you have the people with the lived experience sitting there at the decision-making table. Absolutely. Now, look, I'm conscious of the time and while we have you, I'd love to open up questions from the audience. Uh, so anyone with a question, please get ready. Are the microphones to and I know we've got people online uh, who may also be submitting questions. Just have a look at that. No? Okay. Well, while you're thinking, uh, we'll keep going. Um, I want to go back to Peter um, and talk a little bit, I guess, about... Uh, you know, we may be coming up to an election. Um, talk about how, uh, you know, racism and race will uh, will play into this narrative and how it might uh, compare to, you know, policies of past governments. Right, yes. So, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that's extremely likely is the incumbent governments have worked very well off the back of the COVID um, pandemic. And clearly, those governments, like the national government, um, have been running this, uh, this, uh, this policy that's described to be social stability. So unfortunately, I think the next election is going to bring some of this tough border rhetoric and certainly some of this racialized policy. But on the other hand, I think um, we also need to recognize that even governments that have benefited from are concerned about the impact on social security. And so we've seen, for example, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison talking about um, uh, issues about uh, incivil conduct online, for example. Um, now, I'm not sure if his diagnosis of the cause of it would be one that many people on the panel would agree with necessarily. Um, so he blames things like social media use in general and also identity politics. And probably he'd say is that this forum itself is an example of identity politics and complaining about player, you know, how we're being treated uh, in terms of our identity it should actually be important. Whereas I think probably that backwards to some extent. But certainly I think it does open the window for some policies that are being made that might be beneficial to the question. So for example, currently, while many people are not that happy with it, the e safety bill is going through the federal parliament. And that might um, give people a means to uh, make complaints about um, uh, racist and other forms of aggressive material that's directed at social media. That is a piece of legislation that's going through this government at the moment. So we do have to recognise that. But I mean, talking about the kind of policy landscape around hate and hate speech, we have to recognise that a 
Australia has not done a very good job, really, since it introduced um, anti-hate speech in force during particularly the 1980s, really, onwards, both in terms of the complete utilisation of those laws in the criminal sense. And so Jenny well knows that New South Wales, about six or seven years ago, had a, an inquiry into its anti-hate speech, uh, uh, hate crime laws, and it found it virtually never used, yeah. right? Never used. And even today, there's yeah. still crimes, yeah. and they're still not being used. But there's obviously a problem with enforcement. There's also a significant problem in counting. We do rely on the civil society groups to count these uh, things. And to be honest, I don't think their counts are very good. I think they tell us something's going on, but they don't actually tell us that much. And there's been a real problem for a long time that we actually don't count this social phenomena. If you don't count something, how can you determine it's a problem, right? Um, and, and so I think that is also a problem. But we do have to recognise that there are certainly a number of particular political forces, conservative political forces, groups like the Institute for Public Affairs who oppose uh, anti vilification uh, laws, uh, and the conservative media who oppose any development in particular um, action. So I think it is one of those things where there is the potential, I think, for this to become a political because actually when you do survey people and talk to them, they're very concerned about conduct, incivil conduct in social media. We saw that debate during the same-sex marriage plebiscite. We see it with regards to the Indigenous community who suffer terribly online. And now we see it with the Stop Asian Hate. And what I'd say is that there clearly is a chance for those communities to come together and actually advocate for change in this area. They are actually very big collective. And so one of the things that the kind of anti-hate network here at Sydney University would say is communities who might be periodically targeted need to continue to talk about these issues systematically over time, not just when they are periodically being targeted, but that they build solidarity with communities, other communities, and they draw that into the political So I don't think we can just say, we are aware that there's a problem now, we're going to leave it for our political class to address. Political class created some laws in the 1980s, They've been very ineffective and nothing really has changed. So um, the way the government is performing today, I don't think it's that much different from previous governments. Certainly rhetorically, it's not that interested in this issue. However, a number of factors like um, far-right violence, occasional terrorist incidents, and assaults that occur on the street with regards to prejudice, um, prejudice against gay, uh, gay people, for example, and that issue came up recently, um, has prompted them that they at least have to talk about this issue. Yeah, so I think there's potential. Great. Well, with that, we might open back up to the floor. Have we got some questions for the panel from our audience? Very shy. Can I jump in and add yeah, one more please. solution that I think is, or one more thing that I think it gives us an opportunity to push on which is a positive, and I think it feels at the moment like there's not a lot of positive, is that um, both the state and, and federal governments recognise the value that international students bring, both economic value and other types of value to our society in terms of coming in and studying here. I think there is a real interest in us looking to see if there's a space to be able to push with the enthusiasm to try and encourage international students back to studying in Australia around some of the long held um, reforms that are much needed. So obviously in New South Wales, the, the top of the list is international travel, students, international travel concession access, which is something that has been an ongoing problem in New South Wales. But I have now been you know, pushing directly with, with the government saying, if you want to make this more attractive, now is your time to do it. And no one will be critical of you because we want to be encouraging international students back, but also on issues of housing and support for international students in terms of ability to work and the number of hours that work and the flexibility. So I do feel like if we were to find one small bit of space that may allow us to move in a positive way that actually look, is looking at other, other parts of people's ability to participate in our society, then that does give us one space to look at as we look at that weird intersection between the fact that we're escalating tensions uh, in relation to China, but at the same time, the Australian government is trying to, or parts of it are trying to encourage international students back in this, in this challenge space, which I think is, you know, 
is part, part of the sort of very schizophrenic nature of how we're doing our domestic and international politics under COVID. Right. Yeah, a, good, a good example of that would be in the mid noughties in Victoria attacks on Indian students. Absolutely. Had a real problem that, that the government was sensitized to it, not necessarily because of that interest in communities views, but they were international students. Yeah, yeah. And that, but I mean, I think we have to take those opportunities when they come, right? It's also, yeah. Um, I think I'm, you know, I agree we should take opportunities when they come and that sounds like a really good one. Um, I, I suppose it feels qualitatively different to the mid noughties for me and mainly because of the China factor, I think. And I'm kind of thinking out loud here, but I was really interested in listening to Dave's explanation of what's driving the geopolitics, because for me, I think I, I think what's happening and what's changed, taking aside what's changed from the China side, like putting that aside, but I think it's actually Australia's fear of abandonment from the United States mm -hmm. that's making it, um, kind of go its own path a little more, recognising that the United States is kind of declining in the region. And then I do think it is about the domestic politics that is pushing this. I think that it is good domestic politics to be tough on China at the moment. I think it's always good domestic politics to be talking about national security and warmongering and taking all of those strong incentives to be uh, doubling down on that. I, I don't... I don't know if I see the same, I guess, incentive structures in place to try to fix this problem. And, you know, you just said something optimistic, so I hate to kind of bring no, it back I down to something no, depressing. It's, it's all pretty dark. I was yeah. just trying to, you know, lift the mood no, for and a I second. Think, no, I, I completely <laughs> agree. I just, um, you know, I, like I, I was in DFAT when the Indian student attacks were happening and there was like a huge effort in the bureaucracy to get things back on track with India, big public diplomacy efforts in India. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that now. It's no. not, and I don't see very, I, I don't think it's likely either, it's, I guess what I'm saying. And so, I'm, yeah, a bit more pessimistic, I guess, about the government's interest in trying to improve this particular issue. There is a, I think maybe the other part of it is that is looking at some of the civil society strength at the moment, which I think is, you know, if we, if, if we're to take one sort of, you know, a silver lining out of the fact that the whole world is focused on COVID as a, as a um, problem that everybody is dealing with, it also does allow for parts of our society to rebuild a sense of, uh, a global view of what it is to have international connection, to have an international perspective on the world. And that's not to say that that necessarily is going to appeal in terms of uh, the sort of outcome of a day-to-day -day sort of domestic political election, election or those kinds of things. But I do think the more diversity we have in our society, which, you know, is, is a reality for Australia, whether we think it's a successful multicultural country or not, we are now a very diverse and multicultural country. And so with the level of people being born overseas increasing in terms of our population, level of um, people have parents who were born overseas as a proportion of our population, that then changes that dynamic. And so I do wonder, while I don't hold a lot of hope for the, the formal political power structures, I do feel like there is more of a building sense of an international approach to some of this and an internationalism that to me is the only thing at the moment that is 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 offering a sense of of hope what that looks like in practice i don't know and obviously it doesn't work without all the structural changes as well but there is something in that that i think needs to be boosted up we're just not very good in australia at boosting up our civil society in that way and i think we have to find our leaders in that space and and do that better yeah, I, I agree with that. I think if you look at some of our data, you'll see like Australians have quite a complicated view of migration and what it brings to our society. So the vast majority of Australians say multiculturalism is good for our country. The vast majority say that immigrants bring talents and strengthen our country. Immigrants are good for our economy, you know, good for us culturally. Everyone kind of agrees on that. 
there's still, I think, a persistent minority, about 30%, depending on what's been happening in the world, that say immigrants take our jobs or okay. are a burden on social welfare. That, that's certainly still a persistent part of the Australian population, but it is a minority. Um, it's, just to say on that, yeah. I think it's a majority within our parliaments and a minority within our society. And I think there's also a polarity between where society's views on a lot of that stuff versus the people that are elected to make the decisions. And I don't think they reflect some of those issues of polarity that you were talking about before. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, there are just really obvious examples of this, right? You know, there was um, a great article by Tim Sotsomerson um, after the Biden cabinet was elected, where there was a picture of the Biden cabinet and a picture of the Australian cabinet. And, you know, they, they just, the diversity that you see in the United States at their leadership level, which they complain about, right? They com and with good reason, right? It's not where it needs to be, but compared to Australia, it just makes us look so, you know, so behind in that sense. And then one of my colleagues pointed out that actually comparing the Biden cabinet where they've deliberately tried to represent America to Australia's cabinet is not even as useful as looking at Trump's cabinet where they weren't even trying and it was far, far more diverse right. than ours was, right. you know, which is a pretty depressing indictment. So I think you're absolutely right. I think it is in part a representation issue and the views of the, the views of the broader public are not held by the views of the people, are not held by the people in charge. Yeah, yeah. a sobering thought. Uh, so there is a question here actually online to you, Jenny, mm -hmm. and it does play to, um, to this point on diversity uh, and decision making and getting you know, diverse voices at the table as a you know, crucial step to address racism. So this is from Catherine Chen and she's, uh, I guess, asking for some practical ways to build up that capacity and to get people to step up. And I think, you know, speaking to this audience tonight, of students and postgraduate students, you know, what would be some advice from you in terms of things you can do to really be part of that conversation? Yeah. I think probably the best example is the, the person who initiated the Stop Asian Hate vigil here in Sydney. Um, Shona is, if you're on Instagram, then you should go to Cosicom. Um, that is her uh, Instagram uh, thing. It's got nothing to do with Stop Asian Hate Vigils. Uh, it's basically featuring uh, Korean Australians in a whole range of different things. Um, and Shona basically was like seeing that all these Stop Asian Hate Vigils were happening in other countries, got in touch with the Asian Australian Alliance, said, are you going to have one of these? They said, well, you could organise it if you want. And then Shona went from basically being an Instagram content producer to organising her first ever real world action and there were hundreds of people there and so I think part of it is about finding the connections and reaching out to people to do the things and to get active so basically that to me is is a real obvious way that people can just step up because you know people in in the position that I'm in and I talk to others that are in sort of public profile positions we all have our informal you know chats and, and solidarity network if I get accused of being a front to the CCP or if someone else gets you know a, a outrageous uh, headline on the Daily Telegraph we sort of message and have these informal channels now that's how we build connection between us you know and so I think the same needs to happen with everybody in terms of that online space and in communities to feel like people can reach out and make those connections because that is how you kind of work out who are your people, where can you organise with, how do we strengthen this community and how do you get the support you need to be able to be, you know, potentially the, the only Chinese person in a room while everybody else is making some joke that you find offensive. Well, the best way to do that is to find other Chinese people to bring in the room or to actually find other people that have experienced racism before or experienced some kind of issue before that is similar to yours so that you can have that solidarity. And I think it's really, you know, the, the attack on, and I kind of, I'll put this out there, even though I, I feel like I've been thinking about it for too long and I don't know how to say it. The, the attack on identity politics is by people who have benefited from being white, straight men and their identity has benefited them well longer than any of us might be getting a space to talk about things because of our identity. And I think we need to reframe that to say, well, actually, the, the white heterosexual men 
have benefited for too long from identity politics. And it's now our turn to shift who is the identity that are getting the benefits from their identity. And I think we need to really look at that because there is an identity that dominates and there is an identity that holds the power. And we need to look at how we try and reframe that as not a negative thing, but as a way of saying your turn of claiming your own identity as not merit-based, but simply because you were the white man that showed up, you know, we need to start putting that into question. Absolutely. Well, I'm conscious of the time. I know you Thank need you. to depart. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so I'm much really sorry that I have us. to go. And I just wanted to say thank you so much to Supra and to the China Development Society for putting this on. I really, really appreciate it. And I always swore that when I got elected, I would never be the politician that just left the panel halfway through. And I'm now doing it. I'm really, really sorry. So please forgive me. I don't usually do this, but I had a clash tonight and I wanted to be able to come here and be able to talk to you as well. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the book, Dave. Oh, we do have a couple more questions uh, come in online. Uh, so I'm going to throw this one to Natasha and to David. Uh, this is from no name, but from Sydney University email address. So we'll see you so much. Really um, with Thank intensifying you. geopolitical oh, headwinds yeah, between you for having me. Uh, the um, US and seen. China. Thank you. Yeah. Can, Let me know if you do other things. Or, no, I really did. And I'm really glad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you. See you. Take care. Thank you. That has to be your oh, I've got the mic. Someone with a microphone on. Don't make jokes about Amazing. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll try and tackle this one, um, which is a question on Australia balancing, I guess, between the US and China uh, and, I, and looking at how does it rectify its domestic objectives with international considerations. So I think the question here is, you know, how do we strike a balance when it comes to the US-China tension? And what's the part for it? Easy question for you. Um, I don't know, but uh, look, until relatively recently, let's say until a year ago, I thought we were doing all right. Actually, I think that um, Australia was learning a lot of lessons quickly about some of the challenges in dealing with China, but was also, you know, maybe a little too cozy with Trump for my personal liking. But, you know, we had scenes that I've never seen before. Our foreign minister standing next to the American foreign minister saying, you know, the secretary, sorry, the American secretary saying the secretary has his views on China and I have mine. You know, in the past, Australian leaders would not say that standing next to an American counterpart. Um, I thought we were doing okay in distancing from parts of US China policy that we were uncomfortable with and striking our own path. I think that we're not doing as well now. Um, I don't know if that is about the United States or like I said before, I think it's actually more about domestic politics. Um, but what I don't see from our government is a, you know, what, what are they trying to achieve? I, I, I don't know when I read all the speeches and I kind of study pretty carefully the policy documents. Um, it seems to me that it's quite ad hoc and, um, you know, the idea that our alliance with the United States now has capitals, the unbreakable alliance, to me feels like a ceding sovereignty on some level and saying that we won't make our decisions for ourselves. I know that's not what they mean, but that, that is certainly what it gives the impression of. So um, I guess going forward, if it were me, I would want a more articulate sense of what we're trying to achieve with our tough on China policy. And if it were me, I would want to be achieving the release of Australian citizens in China um, 
the you know limiting interference with Australians of Chinese background here and their families like I think we should have kind of concrete objectives and maybe they do in a dark room somewhere that aren't you know being published that's what I would want to be achieving and I you know I've, I say this to people who are very supportive of the alliance all the time I think that young Australia my data shows this from the annual Lowy Institute poll young Australians do not see the Alliance and the United States in the same way as their older counterparts. And I don't think a convincing case has been made to younger Australians what it's for or what we get out of it. I think older Australians think that the Alliance um, kept us safe and younger Australians are more likely to think that it will drag us into a war. And so I, I, you know, I don't know the answers to those questions, but I do know that, um, you know, Americans and Australians that are older, that talk about fighting in wars together and mateship. Um, I don't think that that is very compelling for a lot of younger Australians. And so if we do have this unbreakable alliance, I think we need to understand why and what, how does it benefit us? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it's, it's natural, I suppose, people see this question in terms of balancing, but it's not, not really an issue of balancing. The, the question facing Canberra right now is whether to, as I said before, do more to try to shore up an American-led status quo or, an, or adapt to some um, post-America environment. And, you know, what I worry about when I look at the elite debate that takes place in Canberra is I can't see, I can't see any attractive option there, you know, because on the one hand, we have this idea of a sort of a, you know, decades-long Cold War confrontation with China and all of that promises in terms of um, the damage to Australian society. But if you listen closely to what people are putting forward as the alternative, you know, people who are imagining some sort of adaptation to a, you know, an Asia that's not dominated by America, I mean, they're talking about increasing Australia's military spending to be able to keep doing the kinds of things that Peter was talking about before, you know, sort of ambitions to hold on to this mini, mini empire. Uh, in the Pacific. And so, you know, so the dovish position is actually, you know, just as hawkish, if not more hawkish uh, in certain ways, um, promising to sort of, um, you know, further deplete public spending on education and health and so on in order to be able to, to continue to do what Australia does at the present time with America's presence, right? So neither of those options are attractive um, to, to me. And I think that, you know, it, in that situation, it's very likely that stoking tensions with China would still be a kind of a, a motivating discourse to, to, you know, to justify this kind of military spending and so on that, that people want to see. So, I mean, I think we have to begin by understanding the, the geopolitical dynamics that are, that are driving this, that are, you know, Australia is playing you know, a similar game to what China is playing, you know, just as China wants to you know, push America out of its immediate region lock down the, the South China Sea. You know, Australia wants to hang on to its, its backyard, which is the way that they talk about the, the Pacific. So, I mean, this is, um, you know, there's no moral high ground on this confrontation. We need to find strategies to counteract the dynamics that are building these tensions uh, in the regions. You know, that means talking about, um, you know, international norms, you know, international law, like we actually mean it. Know, not selectively, simply directed towards uh, China or around the issue of Taiwan, but actually extracting the principles that interest us, be it you know, self-determination, be it anti-racism or so on, and actually you know, consistently um, advocate for those things. Um, you know, we need to be talking about demilitarization. We need to be talking about strategies that you know, will ensure that small countries in Asia are not dominated by, by large countries. That, you know, we need to be linking up a civil society uh, across the region, you know, people who, who share this common perspective, including in China, um, to make sure that, you know, we're doing what we can to diffuse and de-escalate tensions uh, in this situation and talking about, you know, an alternative models for international relations that don't, don't generate these conflicts. Right. Uh, any questions from the floor before we wrap up? Yeah, we've got one here. In terms of the 
um, hate crimes that you have mentioned before. Um, like the issue in Australia, you have mentioned there's a lack of um, police enforcement, or there's a lack of um, there's a lack of a uh, hate crime laws maybe in Australia. Um, I personally feel like maybe uh, is there a lack of media presentation towards the report system of like discrimination that like we daily confronted. Um, I know there's an intrinsic point of like the discrimination you might confront it on the street that like someone just because you never expected anything will happen and it's really hard to record any like evidence for you to report to police and something like that um yeah just like i feel like i haven't seen any like news report about uh students international students confronting discrimination and they have success successfully reported to police and like the convicts has like the convicts has like uh, get the punishment and i do feel like it's very that representation is very important for like the circulation of uh, people are reporting like discrimination and i feel like no matter how much social awareness that we have like towards discrimination if we don't have like uh, people getting like you know punishment about like their behaviors it just like very little cost to people you know just uh, saying random words on street like um, with prejudice and something like that what do you think is the barriers um, now for the media to have like more representation uh, towards um, like um, this kind of like things yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good question and I think um, I think about the work of Paul Aspen uh, who wrote a, a very good piece called Culture of Crime um, Asquith says Australia is very interesting because it has no no um, figurehead for the victim of hate crime. So if we think about the United States, if we think about the United Kingdom, if we think about other countries, we can think about key individuals who have become a rallying cry, you know, gay hate crime, racial hate crime, and things like that. Australia weirdly doesn't have that, and yet we know these crimes occur. Think of the terrible gay hate crimes and murders that occurred in New South Wales during the 1970s and 1980s that are still you know, haven't been dealt with like that. And what Asquith says is that Australia, because it refuses to accept its foundational crimes, crimes against its indigenous people, that it was always going to have trouble dealing with these sorts of social issues uh, and, uh, and talking about them. And if we don't talk about them, then it's hard to recognise them as a problem. If you don't recognise them as a problem, then no one becomes extremely concerned that the laws that exist on the books are not actually well enforced or utilised like that. And so I guess the, the, sol the solution is, is um, we need to talk about these things. And we need to talk about them as a pattern of behaviours that don't occur in any particular community, but occur across communities. And then ask ourselves, why aren't these problems addressed? So the Asian community needs to be as concerned about crimes against it as it is against trans people, as it is against Indigenous people. This is a kind of social solidarity in opposition to a sort of society that allows these things to be. And I guess the, the thing about the kind of media coverage of it is, is that, you know, and the term was used before, as successive prime ministers do like to use this term, Australia is the most successful multicultural society on earth. And when I, I heard a former Prime Minister say that, I was like, on what basis do you make that statement? How do you actually make that claim? Because unfortunately, we don't know the, the prevalence of these sorts of phenomena in our society. They are hard to study, don't get me wrong. Um, they are hard to study. Um, but um, but we, we do need to think about the role that uh, our culture plays in recognising that these are legitimate concerns. I remember talking to my father once. My father... Born in Australia, but Chinese Australian. He was born in Australia in the 19, uh, late 1930s. Lived in Queensland. He once told me he never experienced racism. Right? And and I'm like, Dad, you can say you experienced racism. You know, like it's okay to say it, but he did not want to talk about his experiences because he felt grateful to be in Australia. He felt grateful to be in Australia. 
And there is this um, definite tendency we see for um, political elites to say um, that the laws go too far, the laws go too far. And we see this around the ATC um, anti-vilification laws that they, they, you know, oh, whenever they're used, you know, if an Indigenous person uses it to, to challenge a media elite, they go too far. And unfortunately, the, the kind of media regulation system in Australia is a tool for the tiger. We can think about the role that uh, Alan Jones played in encouraging the Cronulla riots, the hate crimes against um, people from the Middle Eastern background, um, almost 20 years ago. Um, he was subject to a civil, a civil uh, action by the media regulator, not a criminal charge. If he'd been charged by the New South Wales police, he could have done seven years in crime for telling Aussies to go down to Cronulla and bash webs and walls. Why did the police not do that? And so we basically need to have conversations with communities that are affected about what racism looks like, and they need to start taking cases to those, um, those bodies that regulate these things, be that the police, be that the regulators, find where they fail to work, and then popularise the failure of the systems to actually have the impact. So we need to say, Jenny needs to go to the police and make a complaint and then use her position to say, this is how my complaint wasn't dealt with. And, and that's a kind of leadership role. We're not going to see it spontaneously out of the academy. That's a group that spans uh, in Australia. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We've got another question yeah. here and then one at the back. Do you want to take the first question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, just to also just chime in on that second question. Um, Penny Wong gave a speech today about foreign policy. And if you search for her name on Twitter, there are hundreds of comments calling her a CCP stooge for what she said. So, you know, and I think um, that Jenny said that the same thing has happened to her. And I just think, you know, that's a horrific tiny example of uh, the state of our national debate. Um, right now, it seems to me that in the public debate, there is a lot of sympathy for the tragedy that's unfolding in India. And with that, a lot of sympathy for um, Australians of Indian background as well and the way in which their community has been affected. However, um, I think that's probably not representative of the entire country. You know, I mentioned before that there is a persistent minority that is anti-immigration, for lack of a better word. We know that there is, um, you know, elements of racism underpinning parts of our society. Um, I think for a very long time, uh, I'm thinking about what Peter said about his dad. I think Indians in Australia were seen as model minorities in many ways. Um, often they came here speaking English already, relatively well-educated, integrated into business communities and things like that. Um, so that might be one reason that you know, it certainly still happens, but the Indian community hasn't experienced, I think, the same level of racism, certainly not as many of the other communities we've discussed. Um, it's also not well documented, as we've talked about, there just isn't really data on these things. 
Uh, but I do think some of the challenges that other Asian communities are facing in Australia at the moment, um, I, I do think that that could get worse. We certainly, uh, you know, the Indian community after 9-11 was targeted in a particular way for being Muslim looking, I guess, or Muslim in many cases. Um, and then the reason I think I worry about it in the future is I do think um, there are new waves of Indian nationalism happening in India and that has overseas consequences. We've seen a couple of incidents of um, violent assaults in Sydney about protests and the farmers movement that's happening in India. So spillover kind of geopolitical issues into Australia, I think will be more common and that might become more of a challenge. But at the moment, you know, the India Australia relationship is relatively close. There's a lot of warmth there. And so, yeah, I, I don't worry about it to the same extent. David, a question yeah, look, I'm sorry you got that response. It's, um, it's been something that we've seen over the last few years. This is, um, suspicion that is cast towards anti-racist activism. I mean, that has itself become um, subject to these kind of innuendos that um, you know, people talk about. Criticism of Australian racism as a, as a, as a narrative that's being weaponized uh, and so on. And that, that I think is, is something we need to resist. You know, that really has the potential to you know, shut down um, discussion of these kinds of issues that people feel that you know, there's such a crisis at the moment we can't afford to open up about you know, the, um, the, uh, the deep fault lines that exist in our own society, well then, you know, we're in serious trouble. Um, so, look, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, about um, China Development Society's history or, you know, its politics even, whatever. I mean, frankly, I don't care that much, you know? I mean, university campuses in Australia are home to communities from all over the world. Um, and they are, you know, they're often organizations that um, have some communication, some contact with diplomatic representatives. You know, I can tell you, because this issue is on my mind at the moment because of what's going on in Palestine. You know, been on Australian university campuses for 20 years, been involved in um, solidarity activism uh, for Palestine. Um, and as a student, you would always come up against um, pro Israel organizations that would have some kind of connection to, you know, people would come from the embassy or whatever, give a talk and so on. That's, that's politics, you know. Um, I think the problem, you know, that we've, instead of treating these kinds of things in a political way, you know, uh, we've turned these things into national security issues. You know? I mean, I'm, I'm opposed to any kind of nationalism. Like, let me just put that out there. Um, but to, you know, to, to suggest that having people on Australian university campuses who might be patriotic towards China, might have pro-Chinese views, that this is some somehow a sort of security threat, um, this, is, this is ludicrous. Um, this, is, this is something that, you know, that we have opportunities here to exchange views on all sorts of issues, including on sensitive issues um, in ways that, you know, we don't have if I go to China and want to talk about these kinds of things. So, you know, we should take advantage of these things and, um, and you know, recognize that there's going to be political differences, um, but that, um, there's one thing, you know, we should be doing at a university. It is debating, sharing these issues, finding common ground. And I, I, and I know that, you know, that is, um, that's what we're all capable of. So, you know, I, I, I'm really, you know, um, any, these kinds of attacks that Chinese international students are receiving, um, I, you know, really want to stand strongly with you um, against these, um, against these kinds of, um, kind of attacks, you know, acknowledging, of course, that Chinese students come in all shapes and sizes um, as well. Um, and that, um, you know, there are people who, you know, um, you know, we've got to cater to, we've got to create an environment in which people have the, um, you know, the confidence to um, uh, you know, stand up and express their opinions, um, whatever they might be. And I think that the Australian public will actually benefit if we can have a more informed public debate around questions of, say, Taiwan, um, around questions of, say, Hong Kong, um, that the university needs to be the place where we can, you know, we can, um, we can engage those issues in an intelligent way uh, and try to avoid the kind of, you know, explosive tensions that we saw in 2019 uh, and so on that were just, you know, just 
not productive in any way and just shut down the possibility of the discussion. Uh, I just wanted, you know, this is something I think on which we completely agree. And I really, just two things on that. I think most people would consider my research to be more on the security end of things and, um, you know, with concerns about various things that are happening in China. Uh, however, there's a lot of people whose response to that is to shut down debate, as David said, to pretend we don't have these problems and to hide them because they could be used against us. So the survey that I did um, with my colleague Jennifer on uh, Chinese Australians found that a third of Chinese Australians in the past year had experienced some kind of negative treatment and one in five had been physically abused in some way. It was just a completely horrifying result. Um, most people responded to that with, you know, this is data that we need to create better policy and to realize that we, there's a serious problem here. But there were numerous responses that said, you're just feeding ammunition to the Chinese Communist Party to use against us. Um, and, you know, yes, okay, the uh, China's um, foreign ministry, you know, cited that one statistic to say that this is an example of how unwelcome uh, Chinese people are in Australia, of course, didn't mention all of the other findings, which were that the vast majority of people that we surveyed said that they felt a sense of belonging in Australia, that they felt proud to be in Australia, that, um, you know, they, they really uh, felt welcomed by their local communities and a part of those communities. But um, the, the response to these kinds of overseas pressures to my mind is to strengthen our institutions and our resilience and our multiculturalism and our democracy, not to give away freedom of speech because it might be used against us in some way. Most of you will know that last year, a Senator questioned three Chinese Australians about their loyalty and demanded that they condemn the Chinese Communist Party. You know, they said, their, their answers I think were textbook, you know, um, you know, I'm concerned about human rights abuses, but I also feel this, that, you know, but the thing is, they should have been able to stand up and say, actually, I love the Communist Party, and I think it's done great things, and an Australian democracy should be able to take that, and we should be able to have that discussion, but the state of the de debate is, makes that impossible today, and I think that's really sad, and so I really hope universities and other places can be those places, can be an avenue for that free discussion um, and not to, you know, face up to the Committee of Un-Australian Activities. Um. Absolutely. I think uh, we might be out of time. I know there's lots of great questions from the audience, but I think that's not a bad point to end our discussion. I hope that tonight we've taken a step towards standing up uh, and to creating this sense of social solidarity. Um, and it's been such a you know, privilege to be able to sit here and help facilitate that conversation and to hear your perspectives and to share those of our panelists as well. So I'd like to thank Natasha, David and Peter, and of course, Jenny, who left earlier for their time this evening. I think I'm just going to hand back to Andrea to quickly wrap up. Thank you, Jet. Um, just before we end the event, um, we would like everyone to just take two minutes' time to um, fill out this survey for our future events. And while you do that, I would just like to make a few final remarks on the event. So thank you again for our wonderful panelists. Um, a round of applause. <laughs> um, also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of um, the members of CDS who contributed to the organization of this event, including our photographer today, Michael, who's in the audience, um, Rebecca, Yang, Patrick in the China Talk team, who's responsible for hosting this event, as well as the numerous members of um, the team who may not be in the audience today, and also the marketing, media, internal management teams at CDS, who you may not see 
their faces at the event, but who made significant contributions to the success of this event. So thank you again and welcome, um, like very warm welcome to everyone who came today. Uh, we actually prepared some sandwiches, some light meals for everyone and also water outside. So feel free to pamper yourselves with that. <laughs>